Greetings students, Mr. Little here, and today we're going to talk about logistics, technology, and world history after 1945. Now, just a heads up, this presentation in particular is going to make an effort to connect a lot of topics from Unit 8 and Unit 9, so we're talking Cold War and globalization. And while a lot of the things in here may not be explicitly on the AP exam, it is possible you might be able to use some of this in a complexity point or an outside evidence point. So in general, you don't need to stress too much if anything you're hearing here is very unusual. For all intents and purposes, sit back and enjoy this lecture about something called logistics. By the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer the two following essential questions. One, how have changes in technology and production influenced global economic and political situations since 1945? And two, how have developments in technology and production led to both changes and continuity in humanity's relationship with the environment since 1945? And you might be wondering why I chose the date 1945. Well, that's because it's the end of World War II. And after World War II, we get a lot of big technological changes and a lot of big production changes and a lot of big political economic changes. So 1945 is going to be the start date for this very particular presentation. And as I said, and you can see right here, this is really just an attempt to pull together some of the concepts from Unit 8 and Unit 9 uh, and make them easy to understand through a different lens. Let's first talk about what logistics are. Logistics refers to a detailed organization and implementation of a complex operation. Complex operation meaning it has more than one step. So this includes things such as the organization of materials, equipment, and supplies. If you were to run a business, this refers to the point between the manufacturing of your good and the sale of your good for consumption. This is also sometimes referred to as a supply chain, right? And below you can kind of see an example of a logistics chain of a good being produced. If this is a little confusing or you're not quite sure what I'm getting at, think about uh, the phone in your pocket right now or the smartphone that you might be watching this on. For example, I have an Android because that's what I do. But if you have an iPhone, uh, if you have a look at this chart up here on the left, you can see that the iPhone is made up of a bunch of different parts from a bunch of different places. Getting all those together is an incredibly complicated logistical operation. And so what this presentation is going to look at is it's going to ask how technology and organization has influenced logistics and how logistics has influenced world history after 1945. Really quick, let's talk about logistics before 1945. Let's talk about organization before 1945. So specifically in the pre modern pre-industrial era, the logistics were on a very small local level. So for example, farmers and merchants may have dealt locally within their own communities. Uh, they might have organized the sale of their goods. They might have organized local trade fairs. Although there were, for example, banking houses that's discussed in unit two, most organization was local. Remember that Marco Polo gives us this idea that people travel the entire Silk Road, but he was the rare one. Most people did not travel the entire Silk Road. Most people only dealt with their local uh, part of the road. One of the fundamental changes in logistics and organizing, though, comes with the rise of large organized states, which can support and create logistical networks. So for example, you might remember the construction of Saharan caravanserais or the Mongol yam system, which was designed to protect and patrol the trade routes, right? That takes a lot of organization. There has to be a state power that can organize, for example, patrols or the construction of infrastructure. And while states did construct infrastructure, states were more often a little more interested in military force. So for example, the construction of cannons in the Ottoman Empire, which I've done a separate video about, is an incredibly intense process, the organization of cannons, the acquisition of gunpowder, the training of cannon makers and can artillery crews. This is an incredibly complex process that requires the bureaucracy, the know-how, and the resources of a state to create. It's one of the reasons why the gunpowder empires were called gunpowder empires. They had state mechanisms that allowed them to create gunpowder weapons. And of course, maritime empires were part of this too. You might remember that some of the early navigators and explorers were state-sponsored, right? Vasco da Gama was sponsored by the Portuguese, and the Spanish had their Manila galleon system to take their silver from South America to the Philippines where it could be traded. And of course, empires that established armed trading posts, that's also a kind of logistical network. The Portuguese trading post network in the Indian Ocean is a great example of this. It would allow a Portuguese ship to make multiple stops on their way to picking up their trade goods, with the ultimate goal of getting the goods and or the wealth somehow back to the state of Portugal. And as we move later into Unit 5 and we begin to see the first international companies, specifically the joint stock companies such as the East India Company, this is a company, not a state per se, that organizes large global trade endeavors and military operations. The joint stock company is really interesting because they're one of the first examples of non-governmental private organizations for the purposes of trade or military force. And of course, as it changed everything, the Industrial Revolution also changed the nature of logistics. It radically reshaped existing logistics networks through the introduction of new technology, such as trains, later the combustible engine, aka the car, uh, the creation of a, an assembly line production that made goods faster to create, as well as the division of labor that made individual workers much more efficient. New goods at a faster rate, which meant a lower price, meant that they needed to be transported further in order to be sold. This is part of the reason that imperialists wanted 
new markets because they needed a new place to sell all their goods. Imperialism could also be thought of as building new logistics networks by force. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution came the advent of business practices. But you have uh, more international corporations that are sort of the successors to the East India Company, such as the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, which was a financial institution set up to facilitate the logistics of trade between uh, the British Hong Kong colony and mainland China. You have the Bering Brothers, which supported the construction of logistical infrastructure in other countries, such as paying for the port of Buenos Aires. And then you had also companies who were used to their power to influence local governments and, for example, build infrastructure to serve their logistical needs, such as United Fruit, influencing governments in Central America and using this influence to build railroads. So the Industrial Revolution radically changed logistics, uh, not just in business practices, but also in the nature of production. All right, so let's get to the, to the meat of this presentation. Let's talk about logistics after 1945. And so this is going to be talking about some Cold War stuff and some 20, late 20th century modernization really stuff. Quick by, let's start really quick by talking about the Cold War. And one of the most interesting, fascinating, logistically challenging episodes of the Cold War would be the Berlin blockade. Now, you might remember at the end of World War II, Germany was divided up between the four victorious powers, the Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, and the United States. Berlin, the city, was also divided between the four powers, Soviet Union, Great Britain, France, and the United States. Now, as the Cold War kind of got underway, the Soviets, as the Western power in Berlin, was a threat to their power. And so they simply decided they were going to push the Allies out by simply cutting off uh, Berlin. The only way to get there was by plane or by rail through Soviet Germany. And so they thought for sure that this would lead to the Allies leaving West Berlin, but the Allies decided not to, although this was going to be a big challenge. The people of West Berlin needed 3,000 tons of supplies every single day in the summer months, never mind the winter months, right? And at the time when the blockade began, the nearby American Air Force bases only had about planes that could carry maybe three to 10 tons of supplies each. American and British planners, later to be joined by some French airplanes, uh, undertook what is called the Berlin Airlift or the Berliner Luftbrücke, as it's known in German. And essentially, this was a nonstop, around the clock organization to resupply the city of West Berlin in order to save face in this early episode of the Cold War. So essentially, planes would fly, as you can see on the map in the right hand corner, planes would fly from West Germany to West Berlin, they would land, unload, then they would fly back to pick up more supplies and continually make this round. It's said that at the peak of the blockade and the airlift, planes took off from Allied base every three minutes, and the planners behind this operation took it very seriously. For example, they passed a rule saying the pilots had to stay in their planes. They were not allowed to get out and you know use the bathroom. In fact, they had uh, portable toilets and snacks brought to them so they didn't have to leave their planes. And planes had to be inspected every 24 hours to make sure there was no mechanical failures. That said, uh, there were a number of crashes, especially in the early days while they were trying to get everything figured out. And the lack of ground crews was initially a terrible problem. However, local civilians volunteered and formed impromptu ground crews uh, that at their peak efficiency could unload 10 tons of cargo in 10 minutes. So the blockade of Berlin and then the corresponding airlift, which was eventually successful and after about 11 months, the Soviets kind of just gave up. They ended the blockade. Uh, it was a massive logistical undertaking and really demonstrated uh, the logistical power of the United States military in particular, which to this day, the United States military is one of the most logistically competent uh, organizations in the United States, able to rapidly deploy and rapidly move supplies wherever it's needed. Now, speaking of the Cold War, there was a new piece of technology that became very popular after World War II known as the helicopter, right? That's a uh, roto vehicle that can lift directly up and sit directly down. Now, helicopters have been developed during World War II, but they became really popular during the Korean War, which came in the 1950s. Now, the nice thing about helicopters, what makes them logistically very helpful is they don't require long, complex airfields that you'd have to build for a fixed wing aircraft. They're smaller and they're easier to build than fixed wing aircraft. However, because of that, because of their benefits, it is, can be said that they intensified Cold War conflicts. So for example, helicopters could lead to the rapid deployment of soldiers and personnel in combat hot zones. They could provide close fire support against armor, and they might be able to quickly resupply soldiers in the field. So helicopters could add a decisive advantage on a battlefield situation or as the kids say, helicopter go burr. Two great examples of helicopter usage would be the US war in Vietnam, as well as the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, where helicopters played a decisive role in both of these combat operations by being able to traverse a very difficult terrain very quickly, resupply soldiers, and assist in combat operations. These conflicts would have taken a very different shape if helicopters had not been in the picture. And it's also worth noting that we talk about the intensification of Cold War conflict. Both sides of the Cold War, that is the Soviets and the United States, provided anti-helicopter weapons to their proxies. The Soviet Union provided anti-helicopter weapons to the North Vietnamese during the Vietnam War, and the United States provided 
anti-helicopter rockets to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to shoot down Soviet helicopters. So again, we talk about logistics and technology. This can also lead to an intensification of conflict. Let's talk a little bit about health and logistics. Now, one of the things you have to know in Unit 9 is about the spread of new diseases. But what about the eradication of an old disease? It may sound fantasy, but throughout the 1960s and 70s, there was a large push to eradicate one of the most deadly diseases known to man, uh, which was smallpox, which even if you survived it, left you horribly scarred. It was a viral disease that left awful skin lesions all over your body. However, a great target for destruction because it only occurred in humans, it didn't occur in animals, it didn't occur in the soil, just humans. So it was easy to track. You might recall smallpox from the Columbian Exchange. It's one of the diseases uh, that reduced the number of Native Americans after their contact with Europeans and Africans. Now, it's not to say people hadn't been trying to treat smallpox for many years. So for example, inoculations go back as far as ancient China, where Buddhist monks would take the scabs of smallpox victims, ground them up into a powder, and then shoot them up the nose of people who wanted to get inoculated, something that sounds very familiar in the COVID world. Although more famously, the European Edward Jenner uh, put forward the idea of inoculation with a less virulent strain of smallpox known as cowpox, in which he took cowpox scab material and would expose individuals to it under their skin. And while they would get sick for a little while, they would never contract smallpox. This is where we get one of our early concepts of vaccines from. Nonetheless, in the 1960s and the 1970s, there was a real push to try to eradicate smallpox completely and totally. This was originally called for by the Soviet Minister of Health in 1967, and the newly created World Health Organization, along with a number of other private organizations, undertook this massive campaign. So for example, the smallpox eradication unit was created in 1966. And one of its great achievements uh, was that it inspected all 100 million villages in and across India uh, for signs of smallpox. That's, this is a massive logistical undertaking. One of the ways they did this was through something called ring vaccination. Now, ring vaccination is a strategy by which you would search an area, perhaps a village, uh, for signs of smallpox. If you found somebody who was sick with smallpox, you would vaccinate every single person around them, right? This way you created a barrier preventing smallpox from spreading to somewhere else. And this would, of course, be followed up by verification to make sure that the ring hadn't been broken. This was one of the jobs of the World Health Organization, was to check back in vaccinated areas to make sure there hadn't been some sort of breach of the ring vaccination. Now, what's really interesting about the smallpox eradication campaign is that that the logistical supplies were provided by both the Soviet Union and the United States combined in terms of staff and doses. So this is an odd pause in the Cold War. And it's estimated that the total cost of the campaign was around $300 million, which seems pretty small today. A World Health Organization report in the early 2000s found that the cost of the smallpox vaccination campaign pays for itself every 22 days in terms of for the cost of treating potentially sick individuals. The last natural case of smallpox was in Bangladesh in 1975. And since then, there has been no documented naturally occurring transmission of smallpox. There have been cases where smallpox samples kept in a lab have escaped, but there has never been another natural transmission of smallpox from one person to another since 1975. And the World Health Organization declared smallpox eradicated in 1980. Smallpox, along with something called rinderpest, are the only two diseases humans have ever successfully eradicated in history. Although there have been many efforts to eradicate things such as polio or malaria, uh, these diseases remain with us. So let's talk a little bit about logistics and world trade. These things go together so well. So one of the things you do have to know in AP World is about how the changes in technology in led to an increase in both production and trade. Now we've talked a lot about the production side. Let's talk a little bit about the trade side. So you might remember that new technology tends to lead to new trade. In the 1950s, there was a very pivotal moment in the history of trade. And that was when a businessman from the Southern United States named Malcolm McLean designed an intermodule container or intermodal container. And you may recognize this container as the standard rectangle shape that you're always seeing anytime you see a picture of a port or anytime you see a picture of a cargo ship, such as the one here in the right-hand corner. That standard container is his brainchild. He was frustrated. It was taking so long to move goods from his truck onto a ship and then later from his truck onto a train. And so he said, what if you could just have a box that could fit on both a truck and a train and a ship? and he developed the standard intermodal container. Now, the nice thing about the square shape is that it maximizes space because these containers can literally be interlocking. And that way they maximize space on any given ship. And you might recall way back from unit four, the Dutch Flucht was a ship that maximized its space. And this is the same principle at work, just on a massive, massive scale. The beautiful thing about those container ships, you literally just need a flat deck to stack them. So it's an incredible maximization of space. This, by the way, also resulted in an incredible change in how port facilities work. So for example, in the old days, it could take up to a week to load goods onto a ship. So sailors would come into port, they would stick around, ships would wait in the harbor for really long periods of time. But now you don't need all of that. 
Uh, it also means that you just need giant cranes. You need a holding area for the containers and some giant cranes. So if you, for example, have ever been to San Francisco, then you know that the piers are a major tourist attraction. You may have wondered, why aren't they still being used to load cargo? And the answer is, with intermodule containers, you don't need 20 some odd piers uh, to load up a cargo ship. You just need one really good facility. And that was the Port of Oakland. So the Port of San Francisco has effectively become a tourist attraction, while the Port of Oakland continues to be utilized extensively because it has the facilities to process and load these standard rectangular containers. And the containerization of world trade, and that is the use of these containers in world trade, really has a drastic effect on world trade combined with a number of other trends. Uh, but from 1950, so right after World War II, until 2010, so in the 21st century, the value of world trade went from $60 billion to $18,000 billion. That's a 3,000-fold increase. That's an incredible number. As of 2010, 90% of ocean shipping is done with containers because they're easy to use, easy to transport, and you can fit a lot of them on the deck of a ship. In addition, the fact that these containers just need to be picked up and placed on a ship means you don't need a lot of workers. In fact, one study out of Great Britain in 1972 found that these containers increased dock labor efficiency, and that means you need a lot fewer dock workers. And this has in many ways reshaped the global economy with being much easier to send things around the world, combine this with... Uh, national trade policies and it changes in communication. Today, 75% of trade is done via ocean shipping. And while ocean shipping is as old as history itself, in the second half of the 20th century, this has had some big changes. So for example, China's international manufacturing economy has boomed in part due to the containerization of shipping and the ease with which it could export its goods. Whereas China was not even in the top five of international exporters in the early 1990s, by 2006, it had become the third largest exporter of goods in the world, a massive jump. And cheaper shipping means that companies could outsource their production to various parts of the world. So for example, Bangladesh, Vietnam, parts of the Caribbean are now the locations where most of us get our clothing from because it's just so unbelievably cheap to ship things now. I don't think I need to tell you that outsourcing has become a dirty word in the United States, but this is just one example of how containerization, a logistical revolution, has fundamentally changed the economic world. This also includes international supply chains that make things like the iPhone possible as I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. It's also led to the rise of something called just-in-time manufacturing, in which companies attempt to have very little overhead. That is not a lot of extra products lying around. They want to make exactly how much they need and sell exactly what they have to reduce on storage costs. This is made, again, possible by the ability to very quickly receive anything via containerized shipping. You might have also seen a container or a ship uh, with this white star with a light blue background. That's Maersk Shipping Line, and they are the largest shipping corporation in the world based out of Denmark. They very quickly got on the containerization trend in the 1970s, and this has made them one of the largest shipping companies in the world. So long story short, the development of the intermodal container has led to a rapid explosion in world trade, which has led to a reshaping of the economy, outsourcing of production, and the growth of certain countries in their manufacturing sectors. So again, a nice reminder, your iPhone is only possible in part because of easy, cheap shipping. Now, you might think the iPhone is a little expensive, but imagine how much more expensive it would be if shipping was not as quick, efficient, or cheap as it is now. Think about all the places where iPhone parts come from. Your smartphone, truly a miracle. Yeah. At the dawn of the 21st century, a number of American politicians and Western leaders have grown increasingly concerned with China flexing its newly found wealth from its export manufacturing economy. China's leader Xi Jinping has announced something called the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which essentially seeks to connect Chinese manufacturing hubs with other marketplaces around the world. And while there's a lot to this, and it probably deserves its own video kind of exploring and explaining, it's not a bad idea to think about the Belt and Road System as an international logistics network, right? These are way stations by which the Chinese can be able to easily transport their goods to another place for those goods to be sold. Again, not unlike the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean with their fortified trading posts. Each of these places is a potential node in a larger, complex logistical network. If you're curious about the Belt and Road Initiative, I would encourage you to do some more research on your own. Now, what about the internet? I hear a lot of you saying, well, the internet is definitely a big deal and it will have a video of its own. It's also not a bad idea to think about the internet as a kind of virtual logistics network. But I'm not going to talk about it here because the full impact of the internet is only felt in the 21st century. But I will touch briefly on the internet's history. And that is, as with so much technology, the internet began as a U.S. Department of Defense research program. It was called the Advanced Research Project Agency Network, or ARPANET. And basically, the idea was, what if we could just get computers to talk to each other? At its core, that's really what the internet is. Now, of course, computer programmers and coders know that there's much more to the internet. Things like protocols, code, servers, browsers, email, all that will come later. And it, it deserves like its own examination in history. So in 1969, four universities, three in California and one in Utah, connected their computers to create the first computer 
internet. And I'm a big fan of this map, which shows the first ARPANET network in 1969, because it has my own alma mater of UC Santa Barbara on there. But it would not be inaccurate to describe the internet as a form of virtual logistics and the connection of various computers as forming a kind of information logistics network in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Now, what are some of the consequences of our increasingly interconnected logistical world? Well, as someone living in the 21st century, it astounds me the speed and pace with which I can receive anything I want. It, it is truly incredible. There have been some interesting side effects of this, though. So one would be the increase in what we might call uh, global culture. And the internet, in, especially in the 21st century, is really responsible for this. But pre-popularization of the internet, increased shipping of capacity made it possible, for example, U.S. corporations and brands to expand to other countries. Most famously, Coca-Cola became well-known globally, as well as the subject of many anti-U.S. culture protests. However, it worked the other way, too. Increased interconnection with, with regions led to the popularization of other types of media, of other cultural examples in the United States, such as Bollywood films and reggae music. Increased logistics has also led to the, the increased spread of ecological materials. Now, you might recall the Black Death and the Columbian Exchange. We haven't had anything quite that intense, but we have seen, for example, plenty of invasive species, such as the zebra mussel, which is not native to the Great Lakes, but has gotten into the Great Lakes in North America and has been wreaking havoc on the local environment ever since. And of course, we have the COVID-19 global pandemic, which started in late 2019 and is, uh, as of this video filming, still going on about a year and a half later. Some people have cautioned against drawing parallels with the Black Death and COVID-19, and that's absolutely correct. COVID-19 is nowhere near as deadly as the Black Death. And people with, let's say, less than noble intentions trying to draw a comparison about its spread out of China may not take the most nuanced point of view. But regardless of where it began, COVID-19 is a demonstration of how a more interconnected world means that a virus can travel faster than it ever could have on its own. It means a small viral mutation could have a global effect. We also see increased environmental destruction as the demand for certain goods and products increases. This has led to increasing deforestation in places like Southeast Asia, but most particularly the Amazon, which is increasingly deforested for grazing land to grow meat, some of which is for export. And this is a big part of Brazil's economy. So the increasing demand for, for meat in countries, especially in India and China, where people joining the middle class would like to eat meat, such as the United States and Europe do, has led to increased deforestation. And the thing about all these logistical networks is they also do show a certain amount of fragility. We rely on them a lot. So for example, in 2010, there was a volcanic eruption in Iceland. Now, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of that volcano. I'm just going to play an audio file that pronounces the name for me. That volcano. This disrupted airline travel for about a month uh, because there was so much ash in the atmosphere, the planes couldn't fly in the North Atlantic, so between like, Europe and the United States. And of course, some people will remember the Evergreen Suez Canal obstruction that was the subject of many memes. Uh, but the Suez Canal, which was a major artery of world trade, was obstructed for almost two weeks because one of these container ships just decided to slide a little bit and got stuck, as you can see from the photo below. So while we have come to increasingly rely on these logistics networks you know, in our everyday lives and our everyday societies, uh, it does come with a cost. Whether we think we're too dependent on them or whether we think we're not dependent enough on them, we do need to recognize that many of these networks are inherently very, very fragile. And how to perhaps make them a little bit more robust is indeed a question for the future. But anyways, I want to thank you for joining me. I sincerely hope you've learned something from this video, but that you also walk away with a few questions. You should definitely be able to answer those two questions from the beginning of the video. My name is Mr. Little, and I'll see you next time.